Draw near, brothers and sisters. Draw near to each other. Draw near to God. Come and let us worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Let us give him the honor and praise due his name. Good morning, People's Community Church, all of our friends, visitors, family. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning via Facebook, People's Community Church, Detroit.org, and our conference call line at 617-829-7869, as well as YouTube. It's not too late. Invite other friends to join us as we worship together as a family. Let us go before the presence of our King of Kings. Almighty God, we're in awe of your goodness and mercy today. We invite your power by the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us today. We love you, Lord. Thank you that you have made your way of love revealed through your Son, Jesus Christ. Continue to reveal this great love to us as we gather to worship, lead us by your spirit to praise you. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouth proclaim your everlasting greatness. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. This morning's scripture is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1 through 13. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self Seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I talked like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, a woman, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. The word of God, for the people of God, to God be the glory. Join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Amen. Once again, it is a blessing to be with each and every one of you. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. 
all our People's Community Church family, friends and relatives who are with us today. We'd like to ask you to please pray and encourage those who had loved ones go home to be with the Lord. Uh, Brother Henry McKee and the home going of his wife. Funeral celebration will be Monday. Family visitation is today at Cole's Funeral Home, Schaefer, from 3 to 6. Home going for the mother of Maxine Brown, incomplete at this time. She resides in California, but please keep Maxine, our sister Maxine Brown, in prayer. Sister Sally Robbins Browntree and the home going of her brother. So let us pray for Sister Round Tree. Call their names before the Lord. And those who have recent loved ones go home. Let us continue to pray for them. This process of grief takes time, but prayers can solve this journey. Calls and cards will let love let them know that they are loved because we are family. Let us continue to pray for Brother Alfred Cobbs is currently hospitalized. We're thanking God for his healing right now to the brother Wilborn Kelly, uh, Sister Tressie Barnes, Brother uh, Larry Pickett, and Sister Nancy Bonaparte. And if you know of others who are going through challenging times who are in the hospital or ill, please call our church office and let Sister Darby know uh, she can be reached at 313 Six nine zero seven nine one three. So we're praying for each and every one of these families. May God bless and keep each and every one of you. Whatever you're going through, just know the Lord is with us. The Lord is with each and every one of us. He knows us individually. We invite you to join us for weekly Bible study and Bible study on Wednesday at eleven o'clock. The number is five one five six zero four. 9946 and the access number is 5343-47. And we also gather for prayer for evenings of the week at 7 o'clock. The number is 515-604-9094. The access number is 518522-472. We're here to pray with you, to strengthen you to encourage you on this journey. We don't want you to walk this journey alone. So please join us for evenings, Monday, Tuesday. I'm on Monday, Belinda with EBO. on is, EBO is on on Tuesday, and I'm on Thursday and Friday at 7 o'clock. You will find some spiritual food and prayer and fellowship. Also today, um, we have a virtual Sunday school, and if you would like to be a part of that, please send us Email to PCC Sunday School 8601 at yahoo.com. Our virtual Zoom Sunday School is at 9 o'clock, and we invite you to come and bring a friend with you. Once again, just want to thank those who are part of our newsletter. So much information, birthday celebrations, all pertinent information about what's happening at People's Community Church. Please consult your newsletter. We thank those who are uh, putting this together, gathering up the information, and getting it out to each and every one of you. Praise God. Let us remember uh, to be mindful we're still in the coronavirus season. Please, your social distancing, as well as your mask. We thank you in advance for your gifts to this church, all tithes and offerings that are being sent to us. Mail your gifts at Post Office Box 2729, Detroit, Michigan 48202. Or you can send your gift to pcc.org at our website. We thank those who are not even members of People's Community Church, those who are in other cities who have seen our service and have a heart to give. Because God is good to all of us, and it's just giving back to God a portion of the blessing that he's bestowed upon us. Let us thank him right now for these gifts. Father God, we just bless you today. Thank you for touching hearts and minds. 
of those to give to you, Lord, acknowledging the sovereignty of you. And you're the giver of every good and perfect gift, for you are Jehovah Jireh. You are our provider. Lord, we ask you to bless these gifts, multiply them for kingdom building, and bless the givers, Lord, those hearts who are willing to give to you, acknowledging you, Lord. We ask you to bless them richly and supply all of their needs. And we ask it all in the blessed, sweet name of Jesus. Praise God. This morning, we are so blessed once again to have Minister Carlisle F. Stewart IV with us today, and I will introduce you to him. And following our introduction, we will have a music selection, and then you will hear from our minister today. We know God has placed a word on his heart. Minister Carlisle F. Stewart IV. Our church knows Brother the Stewart name because his great grandfather ministered here at this church. And he is the son of Drs. Carlisle F. Stewart III and Jean Castleberry Stewart. Minister Stewart attended Short Country Day School. After completing high school, he applied and was accepted to the University of Michigan, where he majored in behavior and social psychology. During his tenure at Michigan, he was actively involved in the Black Student Union, the Army ROTC, and the Wolverine Support Network, a peer support organization dedicated to mental health awareness among university students. In the fall of 2007, Minister Stewart began his studies at Harvard University School of Divinity in Cambridge, Massachusetts. During his time, he discerned, heard, and accepted the call to ministry. In the course of his Master of Divinity uh, work, he served as hospital chaplain at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. He worked trauma, general medicine, and emergency units, offering spiritual support and attending to patients and families during times of crisis. He also served two years as a seminary and pastor associate at First Church Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a congregational church in the United Church of Christ. On April 15, he completed his master's thesis that explored the sacrament of prophetic pastoring and spiritual liberation in the black church. On May 28 of this year, Minister Stewart received his Master of Divinity degree from Harvard University. And as I stated once again, we're so blessed to have him come and speak to us and share what God has placed upon his heart. Let us pray for Minister Stewart and ask God to use him mightily. To God be the glory, to God be the glory. Following the selection, you will hear from Minister Carlisle F. Stewart the boy.
church, friends, family members, associates, to those of you joining us online. We give thanks to the Lord today for the opportunity to be gathered in body and spirit and mind to be able to share a word and have a moment of worship. When hearing Reverend Gilmer speak the scripture this morning, I knew that God had placed it upon my heart to talk about love. And that scripture was uncoordinated with the scripture that I will read to you shortly, which lets me know that God placed it upon my heart to talk about love. A friend of mine asked me a couple days ago, why I preach on love? A mentor of mine had said that preaching on love is one of the most difficult sermons that you can try to preach because it's so hard to define. And when I thought about it, I said, well, it seems that we need to go back to the basics. So let's talk about love. Our scripture for today is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 18 through 34. Now I'll give you a moment to find that scripture. Text says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked them, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. For there is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that God is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. The word of God for the people of God, thanks be to God. Love is the foundation of the kingdom of God. Will you please pray with me? Father God, we ask that you manifest your spirit in this place today that you lay your hand upon the hearts and the minds and the souls and the bodies of all who are present here with us, virtually and in this sanctuary. Lord, we ask that you lead our attention to focus on your word, to focus on the guidance and the movement of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we are too focused on the world and the things outside of us when we need to be focused on you. God, we ask that your word can fall on open hearts and tender ears. We ask that whatever burdens or weights that we are carrying today, that you lift those from our shoulders and you place those on the altar that you have given us. For we know that we cannot do life without you. We know that we cannot understand without you. We know that we cannot know your truth without you. God, we pray that your word falls on open ears and tender hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth walked the streets of Judea and laid his eyes upon the conditions of this society and realized that something was terribly wrong. At the moment of his baptism, the Spirit descended upon him and drove him into the wilderness. And at that moment, Jesus was not unlike you or I. He was known in his hometown as the son of Joseph and Mary. 
and like many young adults, he reached an age where he was forced to choose a vocation. So there was a worldliness to the carpenter Jesus, but his being in the world precisely allowed him to see what was wrong with the world. In the Gospel of Luke chapter four, verses 16, he calls on the name of the Lord and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So here Jesus is standing in the synagogue proclaiming that the Lord has anointed him to proclaim good news to the poor. He proclaimed that poverty was not a part of the natural order. That oppression, systemic oppression, was not a part of the natural order. It was not a sight he could choose to unsee or a cause with which he could remain indifferent. For then he was declaring to all that something was terribly wrong. And if we imagine this scene play out in our times, a man walks in the synagogue or the church or whatever you want to call it, and says that the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. How would we look at Jesus if he walked in the church right now? Would we recognize him? That's the question. I believe that we would look at him and say, isn't that Joseph and Mary's son? What is he talking about? The spirit is upon him because the spirit has anointed him to proclaim good news to the poor. A passion awakened in the young man, Jesus, for that place that lies deep within us all. Wherever the soul resides, that place that holds your sorrow as well as your joy. His love and holy rage burned at the moment of his anointing. And not only did he realize God's call on his life, but the power of God awakened a revolutionary spirit that was sleeping within him. Jesus was a native of Galilee. He was from a poor and working class neighborhood. And this underclass scratched out a living as farmers, as fishermen, as artisans and shepherds. And day laborers. The small profits that they earned from their labor were quickly consumed by the Roman taxation system and the temple taxation system of the high priesthood. So it's safe to say that they struggled to make ends meet. The fees instituted by their corporate overlords took away any possibility of having a comfortable lifestyle. There was no promise of a Judean dream. By the time the Roman collectors and the high priesthood got done with them, they had nothing left. So when Jesus fixed his eyes upon his world in the aftermath of his baptism, he realized that something was terribly wrong. He saw an economic and a political system that gave the underclass no chance for escape. He saw corruption at the highest levels of religious institutions. He saw indifference on behalf of the people who claimed to speak on behalf of God. He saw a status quo that denied people the right to adequate food and housing. He saw social conditions that dehumanized everyday folks through debt slavery and fraudulent financial practices. He saw a penal system that unfairly targeted minorities and executed any so-called dissidents who resisted the state, a fate that he would soon face himself. So here this carpenter comes along and shakes things up, saying that the kingdom of God will soon arrive on earth as it is in heaven. You see, the kingdom of God was the complete opposite of the system that the Jewish people were living under in Rome. 
the kingdom of God was a complete opposite of every system that was built upon the exploitation of vulnerable citizens. But the kingdom of God was not something to expect in the afterlife, but in this life. Because Jesus came here to show us that the kingdom of God can be built in the here and now. In the kingdom of God, people are protected from exploitation. Their suffering would be eased and they would suffer no more. Because it is difficult to talk to someone about spiritual matters if their stomach is empty. It is difficult to expect someone to be concerned with matters of possibly faith or religion when they can't put food on the table, when their children are starving, when they have no clothes on their back, when they have been displaced from ancestral lands which were the only source of income and livelihood. So in this kingdom of God, they would be saved from their current condition because in that kingdom, Love is the law of the land. In this kingdom, human beings are the best versions of themselves. And all those virtues that we speak of, compassion, empathy, humility, joy, righteousness, justice, are the norm and not the exception. So Jesus restored people's sense of dignity and he restored their sense of hope. He told them that they would be a part of a new world where they would finally be valued and not abused as a part of daily routine. Because in this world, human affairs would be governed by the law of love. Jesus knew that loving God and your neighbor was the meaning of life itself. Loving your neighbor is how you show love for God because you are honoring the sacredness of human life. Life cannot flourish unless love is at the center. Love is the spiritual web that binds us together. Love protects against the invasive spirits of hatred and greed and all of these negative human attributes that we so often criticize. And I say invasive because greed is a cancer. Hatred is a cancer. Greed is a spiritual sickness. Hatred is a spiritual sickness. Love says all life is connected. All life originates from the supreme being, God who is one. You and I are one. Self-love reminds you that you are a being of perfect imperfection that is worthy to be loved, but that you are also a part of a system greater than yourself. And most importantly, that realization demands that we take an active role in our society by loving others. Jesus knew something about that kind of love that pushes you to the point of self-sacrifice. That kind of love that inspires you to fight for the people that you've never met. That aching and crippling love that burns when you see injustice. That kind of love that opens your eyes and binds you to the world around you. For we are all just atoms and dust. That kind of love that makes you realize that so long as my sister or brother is in chains, then so am I. On every corner of the earth. And that's not the love you see in the movie. That's not the love we're taught about in school. This is God-given love that can only be realized when we come into knowledge of our Creator, when we come into knowledge of what God has placed us here to be. Love is more pleasing to God than any sort of sacrifice or ritual that we can engage in. Because in the time of the temple, in order to get rid of the penalty of sin or unrighteousness, people would go through rituals where they would sacrifice or give burnt offerings or sacrifice animals. But love is not a ritual that you can gather a couple of items off the shelf, sacrifice a fattened calf, and everything's good. Love is the living ingredient of an active religion because you must constantly work at it. It's one thing to sacrifice a calf, it's another thing to love those who society says are unlovable. 
It's one thing to pray in private in your closet or in your room, but it's another thing to love those who you have been conditioned to hate. It is another thing to reprogram how society has taught us to be in the world and say that that is not godliness. That is not righteousness. The word of God and the message of Christ does not tell me to be hateful. Does not tell me to be so preoccupied with my own self-interest that I forget about my community or the people who I am bound to in flesh and spirit. Though love may sound like an easy formula when we say, oh, go ahead, just love your neighbor as you love yourself. We throw that word around. People ask, so what is Christianity about? I'll say love. They say, okay, well, what does that mean? Love is not simple. It is not a simple thing. But Jesus demanded that we lean into the difficulty of love to make sure that we never experience a crisis of morals at the highest levels and the lowest levels of our society. My second point is that some people say that Jesus was not involved in social or political change. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because in the year 1313, excuse me, 313, Emperor Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So what did that do? This created a depoliticized, de-radicalized and de-socialized version of Christianity where the gospel message was sanitized and its more radical elements were taken out. Anyone with eyes can read the gospels and see that Jesus of Nazareth, a black man, was a social and spiritual revolutionary who carried the power of love on his head, who sided with the poor against the ruling class and who set in motion a movement where people's lives and religion would reflect the qualities of the kingdom of God. He challenged social convention. He compelled them to engage with issues of their day. And he called folks to the grassroots. He empowered them to preach the truth, the love of God in their heart and their mind and their soul. Because in a time of universal deceit, Preaching God's truth is a revolutionary act. Yeah. Need I say that Jesus was a revolutionary, but not in the traditional sense, because he fought with the weapons of, not the world, but with love, the strongest force in the universe. Jesus sought change from the bottom up, not from the top down. Jesus sought change from the streets, from the people, among the peasants. He did not inspire a violent opposition to the authority of Rome because this would have meant literal suicide to face the military industrial complex of the most powerful army the world had ever seen. Instead, he tended to the spiritual. He tended to the physical. He tended to the moral needs of his followers. He gave them a voice. He gave them a sense of hope. He gave them a sense of dignity. He gave them what the world had refused to give them for far too long. What he gave them was the word of God wrapped up in the law of love, which cannot be extinguished. That's how you change the world. That's revolution. Because Jesus was forming a grassroots movement built upon love and nothing else, which when it comes down to it is a threat to the powers that be. It's a threat to the powers that be, for people to step into their divine consciousness. Because we are more easily controlled when we are hated. Our capacity for critical thinking is compromised. Our souls are cut off from the source. Organizing across cultural boundaries is compromised. And Jesus proclaimed that the God that we serve was the power over heaven and earth. In other words, God is supreme, not Caesar. It's important to make that distinction. God is supreme and not Caesar. Saying that in a society where revolting against the institutional authorities meant certain execution. God is supreme, not the corporate oligarchs who have had their hands in your pocket. 
God is supreme, not the vultures who steal and pillage your land. God is supreme, not the armed occupation force that lynches you in the streets. God is supreme, and God will have the final say. But we have to know who we are as people of God to make sure that our religion, to make sure that our faith is an active religion and is an active faith. Jesus knew there's a right way to be in the world and there's a wrong way to be in the world. There's a right way to treat people and there's a wrong way to treat people. Jesus had no patience for moral procrastination. And he demanded that we move towards this new way of living. But first, we must restore people's moral attitude, which is the first step in societal change. Think about all the ways that we have conditioned ourselves to divide each other and divide ourselves from our own people. Think of all the ways that we have been socialized to see other people as separate from ourselves. Need I say, Jesus was a revolutionary, interested in a revolution of spirit, interested in the overthrow of the kingdom of evil and the victory of the kingdom of God. But the kingdom cannot rise until we wake up and step into love, like Jesus woke up and stepped into love. The Lord is waiting for us to take up our crosses and follow him. We have the tools, but the kingdom cannot rise until we heal the psychic wounds that we possess. The wounds that keep us mentally and spiritually in bondage in states of servitude. The psychic wounds that keep us in states of docility or keep us in states of low self-esteem. Or keep us in a state where we think that we as these as black people, excuse me, are not the children of God. The kingdom cannot rise until we replace lies with truth. The kingdom cannot rise until we see others as an extension of ourselves. That's why he was a threat. Because that was his mission. Because as I said before, and as I'll say again, the powers and principalities thrive off of keeping you in bondage. They know something about the divine power that exists all around. They know about it, but they don't want us to know about it. They want us to be ignorant of it. They want to use and abuse that power in service of evil and not good. They prefer to keep us trapped in a cycle of, hate, of hatred, death, and fear. That prevents us from stepping into love. Because once you step into love, you are set free. Once you step into love, you are no longer human. You become more than human. You become a child of God in human form. The people of God have the power to create the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. But we are still asleep. Why do you think Jesus was so emboldened and impassioned and so invigorated when he preached the word of God? Because for him, that was not merely a vocation. It was not merely a job or a hobby but it was a matter of life and death itself. When he looked around at the conditions of his society and saw the death, and saw the destruction, and saw the hatred, and saw the tyranny that was sanctioned by the powers that be, that is a threat to life itself. That is a threat to God's kingdom. That is a, fret, a threat to our own lives. The people of God have the power to create the kingdom on earth. But this cannot occur until we step in to our love consciousness. This has happened before, and it will happen again. Need I say that the kingdom of God is at hand? The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is at hand. But do you recognize yourself as a part of that kingdom? Do you actively strive to build that kingdom? Do we actively strive to come together and not apart? The kingdom of God is at hand. It is no coincidence, beloved. It is no coincidence, brothers and sisters, that religion has been one of the most deadly sources of division in human history. Who would have thought that our gift of salvation, that our source of divine truth and power, that our faith would be hijacked, rebranded, and resold to us to make us think that Christianity is the white man's religion. 
not knowing that the oldest church on this planet is in Ethiopia and populated by black Christians who have been there since the time of Jesus. The one way that you can annihilate a people is to convince them into thinking that their faith is primitive, to alienate them from their creator. Who tricked us and said that God has no say in our conditions? Who tricked us and said that God does not demand the reversal of injustice? Who tricked us and said that God does not give those who are bound the divine right to break their chains? The divine right to break their chains. Need I say that Jesus was a revolutionary who realized that any social or political change must first be preceded by a spiritual evolution, by a mental revolution in the hearts and minds of the people who are engaging in that revolution. Where the will to love supersedes the will to dominate. The will to love supersedes the will to dominate. For us, there is a risk that those who overthrow their oppressors will become oppressors themselves. Jesus saw love as the only way that humanity could be saved from itself. Because this love is the essence of Yah. This love is the essence of Yah. Who do you think Bob Marley is talking about when he sings? We all defend the right. Jaya children must unite, whose life is worth much more than gold. He's talking to you. He's talking to you, black people. He's talking to you, the wretched of the earth, the displaced of the earth. Where are you right now? Where are we right now? Does this look like the kingdom of God? I'll leave that question up to be answered by each person listening. Jesus saw love as the only way that humanity could break up. But what use is changing the existing structures if we replace them with ones that are just as corrupt? The law of love is the platform upon which all societal change must occur. All of the Abrahamic religions that you are familiar of with Islam, Christianity, Judaism, hold to the principles of justice spoken by Moses and the prophets. And I'll say that any theology or religious principle that is preached within a church that is indifferent to the cause of justice, that is indifferent to the truth and equality that God preaches, or fails to condemn persecution or exploitation of any group is not the will of God. It is not a reflection of the will of God. There's a reason why our text for today is called the greatest commandment. So let me explain something to you about this word covenant, the law of Moses or what you know as the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments in the time of Moses and the aftermath of the Hebrews' liberation from Egypt were designed to be a rejection. Hear me, listen. They were designed to be a rejection of the oppressive social norms that they had endured in Egypt. The Ten Commandments were not supposed to enslave you or control you. They're supposed to set us free. It was a new social contract that reflected human conduct within the kingdom of God, where life was governed by the law of love. The Ten Commandments were divinely inspired social and economic policies that guided human interactions. They ensured that people would not steal or covet your possessions in an agricultural society where people had lived. They ensured that people would not take advantage of someone else's misfortune. They ensured that the hoarding of wealth and resources would never take place like it had happened in Egypt again. It was a safety net for the vulnerable, so no one would be lost to the wolves. The covenant was designed to prevent the Hebrews from regressing, from regressing into ways that did not reflect the kingdom of God. Hence why the call to love is the greatest commandment. 
because the commandments revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai are all built upon the principle of love. Yes. The commandments will become a prototype for future liberation movements. So in America, when we reflect upon the crimes that have been committed in the name of liberty, we don't need to be reminded of the scars left from generations of class struggle, from generations of struggles against systemic racism, because they are still open wounds. Every time you turn on a television and you see another black man or black woman being murdered in the street, you bleed. Every time someone dies due to neglect from a lack of health care or poverty or homelessness, you bleed. Would Jesus be indifferent to this suffering? Would Jesus be indifferent to evil? Would Jesus sit back and say, oh, that's just the way of things. I can't do nothing about it. What can one person do? Would Jesus be pushed to the point of despair by feelings of his own powerlessness or hopelessness? Or would he organize? Or would he love people as he loved himself? Or would he walk through communities through streets, through towns and villages, healing people, loving people, yes. giving people hope, giving people a future. What would Jesus do? Yes. Would Jesus be discouraged by the seemingly impractical possibility of changing the world? Would Jesus be indifferent to such grotesque inequality? Would he be indifferent to evil? Would he be Indifferent to 50 million unemployed. Meanwhile, hundreds of billions of dollars are being pocketed by the rich and wealthy. Would he be indifferent? There's a lot of talk about revolution and what that would look like. There's a lot of talk about systemic change and what that would look like. But that is a journey, not a single moment. That is a movement, not a single march. Because the people of this nation, of every race, of every gender, of every sexuality, are fed up with the system of bondage and servitude. They are fed up with not having a future for themselves or their children. They are fed up with being treated like dirt. But it's not just about the overthrow of a system, but making sure that justice is weaved into every part of the system that replaces it that the law of love is weaved into every part, which is the essence of Christianity, which is the foundation of life itself. Hearing the call of the power of freedom leads nowhere unless leaders and followers can organize themselves into a movement that can mount resistance to the oppressive system. The people of God cannot organize into a movement until they are governed by the law of love which governs the kingdom of God. The people of God cannot be set free until love and justice become their primarily, primary motivation. Beloved, need I say that Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus was a revolutionary who believed in the coming kingdom of God. He believed that that kingdom could be built on earth as it is in heaven but must be governed by the law of love, by God's word, and by God's divine truth. But the truth is that we have to know that. We have to remember that. We have to move with each step with knowledge of Christ and knowledge of God, and knowledge that God's word was revealed to us to set us free, not to keep us bound. God's word was revealed to us to remind us who and what we are. So I pray that as we go forth, we move with the spirit of love and righteousness. Yes. We love others as we love ourselves. Yes. We remember the greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen.
God, the children of God, we are children birthed out of law. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And his Son went to Calvary's cross because of love. So we are children of love. Let us grow in love because the world needs love now. And if you've heard this message and you're not a part of this love family, you're not a sister or brother of Jesus Christ, we invite you today to give your life to Jesus. There is no other way. Give your life to Jesus for the word of God. It's not what you can do. You cannot bring anything to God for salvation, but you can receive the gift of his son, Jesus, who paid the price for all of our sins by bleeding and dying and being resurrected. We thank God for Jesus. And the word of God tells us in Romans 10, 10, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. So today, if you can believe with your heart and profess with your mouth, we say to you, welcome to God's family. You don't have to get ready for salvation. You just have to receive the gift. And if you have, we invite you to please call our church office at 313-690-7913. would love to walk with you on this journey of Christian salvation and sanctification, being changed in the likeness of Jesus Christ. That's who we are, a work in progress, constantly being changed by the Spirit of God in us, that we would bear fruit of love, that we would bear fruit, and that love would bless those in this world today. For the Word of God tells us to pray and don't faint. Be anxious for nothing, but in all things to pray and give thanks to God. It is time to go to the throne of grace to talk to our Father, because prayer is communicating with the Father. He's a God who hears us when we pray. And the word says that we know that he hears us and we have what it is we have asked for according to his will. For he is a wise God, a merciful and loving God. Let us talk to our God. Father God, we just bless you today. We praise you today and we magnify your name because you are love. You are love. Help us, Lord, on this journey to be a people of love, for love does no harm. Lord, love is patient and love is kind. Long suffering. Help us to be and bear the fruit of love. Forgive us, Lord, for we have all missed the mark. We have come short of your glory, but we thank you that we can come because of Jesus. The curtain was torn and there is no division. And we can approach your throne and ask you, Lord, we have sinned. Forgive us. Cleanse us. Thank you for the blood of your Son that cleanses us from a guilty conscience that brings us into eternal life. We give you praise today and we thank you for your Son, Jesus. Thank you right now that we are victorious because of Jesus. Thank you right now, Lord, for the servant this morning, Minister Stewart, who came to pour out his heart to share love and the need for love. It's not just a word, but it is action. It's how we live our lives, how we treat one another, how we encourage and strengthen one another. It's about one another and love for our God Almighty. Help us to be a people who love you, Lord. And love means our obedience to you. And let us love one another. Let us be compassionate and gentle and kind. Lord, with one another, we thank you right now for love. Thank you for blessing our brother, covering his family. Shower him with grace upon grace, Lord. 
and mercies new every day. Whatever you seek, he stands in need of. Lord, we ask you to provide for him and strengthen him on this journey of being a spokesperson for God, sharing the good news of Jesus. Lord, we pray for all those who are sick, those who are shut in. Lord, meet each and every one, for you know your people individually, Lord. You know their hurt, their pains, their challenges, their disillusionment. And we're asking you to touch them, restore them, heal, Lord, for you are Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. Jeremiah 30 says, I will restore you to health. And 1 Peter 2 says, by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed. So we want to thank you today, Lord, for healing. It is the children's bread. And we give you praise and thanksgiving when you walk this earth, you heal. And you're the same God today. And we thank you right now for moving mightily, for healing bodies, healing families, healing marriages, Lord, healing relationships, healing in our cities and in our states, Lord, in our country and our world. We need healing. We need restoration love to prevail, that unconditional agape love, Lord, to move from heart to heart, to mind to mind. Oh, Father God, we ask you to move mightily, be merciful unto us, Father. Continue to bless all of those on this prayer line, on the live streaming, Lord, those who are here, technical support to encourage us. We ask you right now, Lord, to bless your people richly and abundantly, to give them peace, to bring healing in the land. Father, all of those who are sick and shut in, we ask you to touch their hearts and minds and let them feel the presence of a great and mighty God. Thank you for covering our people's church, all of the offices and all the decisions that are before them during this time. We ask you to guide them with the wisdom from on high. Lord, that your wisdom will permeate and penetrate their hearts and minds, that you will get the glory, that we will all be on purpose for kingdom building, Father. Thank you right now for being the God of life, for you come to give us life and life more abundant. Thank you for abundant grace. Thank you, Lord, for abundant grace, your hand of grace, your unmerited favor upon your people. We bless you today, and we thank you, Lord, for moving in the midst. We are asking you, Midst, in the midst in our nation, Lord, for the cries of injustice, Lord, for need for peace, but the ultimate cry is a cry for love. Have mercy on your people, Father God. We're praying for those dealing with the wildfires in the west part of this country. We're praying for those dealing with hurricane threats in the southern part. Lord, we ask you to move in our nation. Move mightily. The word so God bless the nation. God is the Lord. We need you, Lord. We need you to move in our nation. We need you, Lord, to move the virus away. We ask for forgiveness. We ask for, for mercy. We ask for your wisdom to prevail, Lord. We pray for those who make decisions over us, and whatever authority, that your will be done because you are the supreme leader. We look to the hills from which come of our help. Our help is from you, Lord. No matter who's in office, no matter who has power or authority, ultimately we're looking to God Almighty to move on behalf of your people. We thank you right now for hearing our prayer today. We thank you right now, Lord, for blessing us and being a refuge for us. Help us to be a people of faith. We came into a relationship with you by faith and not by fear but let us walk by faith. Let us trust in a God who is faithful, who will sustain us up and down the highways, the freeways. You are our refuge, our stronghold, and our strong power. We will not fear, but we will pray and let love prevail on the streets and the highways. We will not be angry, we will not destroy, we will not speak words to bring down our brothers and sisters who do not know you but we will speak love and thank you for blessing your people to come into who you are, the God of love. Bless those frontliners who are still caring for those going through, the, through with this virus, Lord. We thank you today for blessing us richly and once again for the message of love because that's what Christianity is all about. It is about love. 
let us let our light show so shine before men and women that they will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. And we ask it all in your precious and holy name, to you be the glory. Join me with the 23rd Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, like a pair at the table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. <laughs>
forever and ever. World without end. Amen. Amen.